On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the Russian maritime oil ban goes into effect on Monday, December 5th. What does it mean for you? I'm your host, Sal Mercaglano, and welcome to today's episode. So we've been talking about the Russian maritime oil ban for a while. And what I want to do today is talk about some of the potential scenarios that unfold on Monday and also how this is going to impact you directly, whether you're an oil commodity trader, whether you own a tanker, or more likely you're just heading up to the pump to get gas or diesel for your car or truck. So we're going to break this down for you. Hey, if you're new to the channel, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into this story. So let's head over to marine traffic and take a look at the world in tankers. So our red dots there are all tankers moving around the world. And one of the things you see very quickly right here is how many tankers there are in the world. But in the case of Russia, we're looking at a couple of key areas. We're looking at the west coast here, Vladivostok and oil coming out of there. We're looking at the Black Sea, oil coming out of the Black Sea from the Central Asian fields via the Turkish Straits and eventually the Suez Canal. We're looking at oil coming out of the Baltic uh, Sea through the Danish Straits into the Kattegat and the Skagerrak and then from the north side of Russia out of the Yamal fields, either heading through the Norwegian Sea or the Northeast Passage and through the Bering Sea. And this is how Russia gets its oil out. And if Russian oil is not getting out, what does that mean? So we're gonna look at this story first from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, tankers ready for new trading map as Monday's Russian ban looms. So there are two things that are gonna happen on Monday. Number one, all maritime oil exported by Russia, this is oil carried on ships, doesn't matter if it's a Russian ship, doesn't matter if it's on a Greek ship, doesn't matter, is going to be prohibited from going into the G7 and European Union countries, including some other ones. So that's going to go in effect. So right off the bat, Russia is going to lose its ability to get oil out. Up to this point, you can still ship oil to some of these countries. But now that got, that's out. Now, they can still ship to China, to South America, to India, to Africa. That's still legal. They can still do that because they're not part of this economic sanction. And let me be clear, if you ship that oil to one of those countries and they refine it, that's clean oil. That is clean in the terms of it's been laundered, it's no longer Russian, and it could be sold to any of these countries. That's why I think Turkey is looking to profit immensely from this, getting Russian oil refining it and then selling it. Same thing with India and China. This story from Sam talks about the next element, which is the price cap. The U.S. and the G7 came up with this idea of a price cap. Let's continue letting, allowing Russian oil to flow to those countries not sanctioning it, but diminish the cost of it, lower the cost of this. And the idea here was they didn't want to just stop Russian oil because they could do that. They could just stop the shipments of Russian oil. They can get the navies out and blockade. They can do that. The problem is that's going to cause a huge economic impact because all of a sudden you lose all that Russian crude on the marketplace and there's no substitute for it. There's not enough other oil to, to take its place. At the same time, they wanted to punish Putin for the invasion of Ukraine. So they came up with this idea of the price cap. So Russia can ship its oil out. It still can't go to sanctioned countries, but it has to do so under a set price cap. In other words, they can't sell it more than this price per barrel, which they haven't come to an agreement yet with. Sam here talks about that the members of the EU have agreed on a $60 barrel price cap on Russian seaborne oil. I think Paul, Poland is still balking at that. Poland wants something lower. In particular, what Poland wants is a moving number that is below what is the going price for Ural crude. And, and understand, Ural crude right now is selling for below $60 a barrel. Its listed price is about 60, 60 to 65 but actually it's selling for a lot less than that. And the mechanism they're going to use for this is a really complicated mechanism. Oh man, I can't tell you how complicated they're doing this. They're looking at using the insurance, particularly the protection and indemnity insurance, so that the cargo would have no liability insurance. In other words, if something happened to the cargo, it has spill, there's no way to go against the insurance company for this. So you would basically be selling uninsured cargo out there. And the idea being is that nations would not accept uninsured cargo. The Turks, for example, have announced as of December 1st, yesterday, if you don't have P&I insurance, you can't go through the Turkish Straits. 
So this may be the mechanism they want to use. And understand the 13 big P&I companies represent about 90% of all the insured cargo in the world. Now, there is a danger of the Russians going out and getting self-insurance or coming up with other insurance. I mean, you've, you've all heard the, the, the horror stories of a DWI driver, three DWIs can still get insurance. It's just going to be expensive and cover nothing. But as long as they have insurance, that's all that matters. We will probably see this. And what we see here is that being taking place. Now, talks about deputy head of the Ministry of Transport said at the Russian Energy, uh, Ch Russian Chinese Energy Business Forum held via video link earlier this week that China has begun refusing to recognize ship owners insurance documents issued in Russia, including by the Russian National Reinsurance Company. The Russian National Reinsurance Company is Russia self-insuring itself. And China has said, we're not going to recognize that, which means that Russian ship owners are facing uh, refusals from Chinese authorities and companies, and they may not be able to get their cargo out. All of this comes down to this issue right here, that according to the S&P Global Community Insight, Russia's seaborne export, crude exports to Asia increased by about 31% year-to-year average, about 1.6 million barrels per day in the first 10 months. China's seaborne crude inflows from Russia surged by 36 uh, percent, average of 780,000 barrels today. India's buying has jumped to 450,000 barrels per day. If all of a sudden China, India, Latin America start refusing Russian oil because they don't have proper documentation and insurance, this means that Russian crude is not going to be available on the marketplace. And that means that these countries are going to have to get their crude oil from somewhere else, which sounds great. It means the U.S. exporting oil is going to go through the roof. But what if OPEC decides to limit? They have a meeting this Sunday. What if OPEC keeps their cap down on production? That means we're going to see fuel prices spike around the planet because all of a sudden, the available crude to refine into gas and diesel will decrease, and that could mean potential shortages. Or Russia could sit there and say, you know what, we're going to stop exporting Russian crude. Now, I think that's unlikely. I think that's an unlikely scenario. But they could do it, in which case that takes Russian crude off the market and does the same impact. The question is, who suffers more? Does Russia suffer more from that? They get most of their income from energy. Or does the developed world suffer more? If you look at what happened in COVID, the nations that suffered the most during COVID in terms of their economy were the developed countries, not the underdeveloped countries. That just came out in a recent UN report. This next story from Greg Miller over at Freight Waves kind of builds on this a little bit more. And again, I'll have this in the show notes so you can take a look at it. He covers a lot of what we're talking about here. He, as a matter of fact, cites the fact that Russian Ural oil right now is well below that $65 mark, actually citing it as selling at around $54.94 at several ports. So, you know, how can Russia maintain the volumes here? Uh, this is a big issue. It, Russia seems to be selling more crude oil now than it was prior. It seems to be up. Uh, the other aspect here is the shadow fleet. Is uh, This was raised also in Sam's story. But we mentioned it here is that Russia is operating this shadow fleet of vessels that is basically doing what the Iranians and Venezuelans have done with basically moving oil around the world, doing ship to ship transfers out of sight and being able to evade a lot of the sanctions involved. Greg highlights the safety and environmental risks of this fleet, a fleet that's operating outside the bounds of normal traffic is not going to follow marine pollution laws, you know, do ship to ship transfers out on the high seas without uh, uh, booms around them, without tugs to maneuver them. And you are increasing the potential risk of a marine spill of oil and environmental danger. It's, it's really, really a dangerous thing. The other thing that he highlights, I think is a really important one, is that we're looking to push the length of time, the age of these vessels out. The Russians and others are buying vessels well beyond their normal service life. Uh, the UN uh, UNCTAD just released their review of maritime transport. I could do a whole video on that. But one of the interesting things they came up with here is that over the past decade, the age of the fleet 
has been increasing. And particularly if you look at oil tankers, for example, average age of oil tankers is about 19.7 years. That is up about five years, four or five years from where it was a decade ago. The other element here is ship construction is way down. Oil tankers, we were building about 125 million deadweight tons of tankers about a decade ago. We're down now to less than 50 million tons of tankers. And this has a variety of issues. It has to deal with the consolidation of shipbuilding into three countries and really a few companies in those countries, China, Japan, and Korea now building 94% of the world's shipping, but also because of the issue with new propulsion and movement of, uh, of goods. No one wants to build new ships because if you build a ship with a propulsion plant that's going to be illegal in a few years, that's a problem. Add to it new IMO standards going into effect in 2023, which is requiring the older vessels to slow down, meaning you need 7 to 15 percent more carrying capacity to move oil. The oil out of Russia, even under the price cap, is going to be sailing greater distances than it was prior to this. So your ton miles increase. All of this really measures a real big problem here. And even under the price cap, we're going to see increased costs because of transportation. So charter rates are going to be expensive, even though the Russian oil may be cheaper, the transportation to do it, the insurance for these vessels is going to be more expensive because you got to get around insurance companies. Uh, th this is just a situation that is ripe with problems. And I'll give you the worst case scenario here. What happens when the Turks don't allow a Russian or a tanker with Russian oil to transit the Turkish Straits because it doesn't have insurance. What does the Russian Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Mediterranean Fleet do in this situation? What if the Danes, the Norwegians, the Germans, the Swedes do the same thing in the Danish Straits? What happens if countries start basically not allowing Russian oil in? The closest scenario I come back to this is literally the Cuban Missile Crisis. And while we're not on the precipice of nuclear war, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when the United States initiated its quarantine around uh, Cuba, it stopped Russian and Russian-backed ships from sailing in. Now, it, it set a quarantine zone and then later shrunk it so as to avoid confrontation. But what was going on in the background was political talk. There was this all this political dialogue going on to basically fix the situation. I don't think there's any political dialogue going on now between the G7 European Union and Putin to defuse the overarching situation, which is Ukraine. And that's the problem. They are trying to enact a economic coercion strategy against Ukraine using insurance companies. And I, I just think, number one, that's incomplete. It puts a lot of pressure on these insurance companies. But unless you bring in the classification societies, the flag states, and you put some force behind this, it's not gonna work. I, I just don't see how this has the intended consequences. It's gonna have consequences. It's gonna drive the market insane, but it's not gonna have, I think, the intended consequences of squeezing Putin the way the G7 and the EU thinks it's going to do. I think it's going to have worse consequences on the rest of the world than maybe it has on Putin. I, I may be wrong. My opinion on this. But if you're going to do economic sanctions on oil, there are other ways to do this. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Hit that super thanks button below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon, become a patron of the page. I've got monthly, yearly subscription rates. You can see the link at the end of the video or down in the show notes. Until the next video, this is Sal, signing off.